So first of all, I want to say welcome to Truckee Meadows Community College and to this week of free events, and which is really terrific. I am so delighted that we're here together tonight to share in this information and to share in the good works that I think we'll be learning about through the panel tonight. Good works related to water. Water is the world's most valuable resource, in my opinion. Whether we are talking about drinking water, about 1% of the world's water is both accessible and drinkable. And only 2.5% of the world's water is drinkable, but unfortunately, 1.5% of that is not accessible at that point in time. So when it comes to sustaining human life, water is truly the most valuable resource. And when it comes to sustaining, protect, protecting and sustaining sea life and other fragile ecosystems and our freshwater sources, water again needs to be protected. Water pollution that results from human consumption or recklessness due to corporate enterprises cannot continue, cannot continue. And it's really going to be up to a citizen's effort through education and understanding and action if we're going to not just protect human life, but protect the world. I would like to thank our panelists. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm really looking forward to what you have to say. I'd like to thank Julia Hammett and the Free Committee for putting this week together. Tonight we're going to learn from our panelists about water conditions <coughs> all over the world, which is going to be fun. And this panel exemplifies a larger initiative that Truckee Meadows Community College has recently embraced. And I was asked to talk just a couple of minutes about it. And I'm going to hurry through this because I really want to hear the panelists. This fall term, TMCC joined approximately 600 other colleges and universities by signing on to a climate resiliency commitment through the organization Second Nature. If you indulge me, I'll, I'll just explain briefly what Second Nature is because I do think it's important. Second Nature is an organization designed to help colleges like TMCC to reinvent ourselves, to reinvent ourselves as a healthy world college. With the leadership of the TMCC Equity and Inclusion Office, led by Yvonne Allen, and with the leadership of our faculty sustainability liaison, Dr. Julia Hammett, we are going to make significant improvements in creating a healthy world college. In late 2006, 12 visionary college and university presidents came together and created, terrible name by the way, the American College and University Presidents Climate Commitment, or the ACUPCC. Okay, and for years, none of us who've been involved in this effort have been able to, have been able to uh, speak that title with any great fluency. So fortunately, the title is now changed and it's simply referred to as Climate Commitment Second Nature. But these 12 visionary presidents, and one of them I was fortunate enough to meet years ago, right as I began to enter administration, and I, I just think she's fantastic, and that's the president of Lane Community College. Well, they were motivated by their conviction that higher education had the capacity and the responsibility to lead efforts on climate and sustainability for the sake of students and for the sake of our society. These founding signatories worked with Second Nature, Eco America, and ASHI to develop the commitment. And in early 2007, they invited peers across the nation to join an historic endeavor. They've now been rebranded the Carbon Commitment, and a new Resilience Commitment was introduced. That's the one that we have signed off on at TMCC. <coughs> as well as a holistic climate commitment that integrates the goals of carbon neutrality and climate resilience. The mission of Second Nature, and thus part of the mission of TMCC, is to proactively build a sustainable and positive global future through initiating bold commitments, scaling successful actions, and accelerating innovative solutions among leadership networks in higher education. And that's from the Second Nature website. Second Nature envisions humanity thriving through healthy, just, and sustainable living 
within a dynamically changing Earth system. Since its founding in 1993, Second Nature has played a critical role in mobilizing higher education to move the needle towards the goal of a sustainable society. This week, there are two other free events after tonight that you should know about. So tomorrow night, before the flood, a film, that's the title of the film with Leonardo DiCaprio, a film and discussion happening right here at 6 p.m. And after the film, there'll be a discussion, and my understanding is it's co-hosted by the Citizens Climate Lobby in Reno. And then on Thursday, March 30th at 9.30 a.m. in the TMCC Student Center, our TMCC students will be presenting their work, Interdisciplinary Water Projects. So if, I'm actually gonna to try to clear my schedule to pop in on that if I can, because I, I'm really excited to see what they've come up with. So that'll be a, lo a lot of fun as well, and very, very interesting. So, there is a lot going on, and without further ado, let's get this panel started. And in order to say just a few words about free and to introduce our esteemed panelists, I'd like to reintroduce Dr. Julia Hamlet. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I would like to tell you a little bit about free, uh, which means faculty for radical empowerment and enlightenment. And there's a number of free faculty in the room. Could you stand just for a second, the faculty that helped put this together today? <laughs> so we've been doing this for uh, over a decade. Every year we come up with a theme. We do these learning communities. And our traditional thing is, has been to work with our students and then have one day which is, which is a student-centered day, and they, and they present their research, or we talk to them and interact with, with a group of classes from a lot of different fields. This is a STEAM project, so that's the science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And so we have courses across the curriculum that work together on this. And uh, this year, um, uh, our, our, this academic year, our free cell catalyst, Dr. Mikaela Rubakava, came up with the idea of watersheds. And so we thought, and so then we just thought this would be perfect with our, our, our idea about sustainability. So I decided that this would be a good theme, watersheds and sustainability finding a balance. So all four of our speakers today, and you can see their bios in the program. If you didn't get a program, there's more on the table back there. But all, all four of them are scientists, they're managers, and they're all someone who cares passionately about stewarding our environment uh, and our resources. And they're all focused on different geographical scales from the local level to regional levels and in different parts of the world. So I hope we all learn from them and each other as we discuss their presentations in about one hour from now. So let's begin tonight with Reno City Councilwoman Naomi Doerr. Um, we obviously have a number of different scales to discuss tonight, and I appreciate Julia starting at home. Let's go local first. Um, so many people have maybe heard a little bit about this project, but really know very little about it, that it was a great opportunity for me uh, to present some of the information you're going to hear tonight. So I've only recently become a council person in the last two years. Most of my life, I've been a scientist. I went to UNR <clears throat> for both my undergrad as a geologist, <clears throat> my graduate school as a public administration and public policy in water and natural resources policy. And so when I had the opportunity after uh, decades of working in my field all around the country to come back home and to work on flood management in the Truckee River and also to restore the river, even more important to me, I grabbed at it. Let's see. Um, we're gonna talk today about the Truckee and, and you have the starting point there at the um, Lake Tahoe and it goes north. A lot of people think it goes from west to east, but it actually flows a bit west to east, but then it ends up north in Pyramid Lake. Can you guys see these slides okay? Yeah. Do you, I think we should turn the light down, to be honest with you. So the Trekkie River Flood Project started around 2005, and the focus was the area from Reno, and uh, we'll try the laser pointer right over here, all the way down to here, which Wadsworth, and this is the beginning of the um, Truckee, the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe right in here. And 
the big question, of course, why was this project needed? I don't think we need to answer that question after what we've just been through. But what we've just been through actually pales a bit compared to the floods of 86 and 97, where the entire valley, for those of you who weren't here then, the entire valley filled up with water. Um, this is just one picture of that time. So flooding is a very major problem in northern Nevada. We've had major floods since the 1800s, and a major flood during the 1900s about every 10 years. And typically, it's a warm rain on snow event that causes the kind of fl the floods that we see, and that's unlike the kind of flash floods that you hear about in Clark County. Um, this biggest flood was in 1997. They call it the flood of record. It was a 117-year event, which means it was over a 100-year uh, event. And what does anybody know what a 100-year event, what that means in statistics? Some of you are scientists. It means that you have the chance of having that flood 1% chance every single year. So you can actually get 100-year floods back to back. And we've seen these 100-year floods on a 10-year recurring interval. So it's actually a statistical chance of that kind of flood happening again. So 117 is more rare. A 250 is more rare yet. In this 1997 flood, we had about $700,000 uh, of damages and uh, over a billion dollars of damages in a six-county area. And they say that if we had that same flood today, it would be closer to $2 billion of damages with the time value of money. Um, climate change is increasing our risk of flooding as the um, temperature warms and as we have more uh, rain, less snow, or more rain on snow events, we're going to be seeing more flooding. And I really think that this year that we've just been through, this winter season, is going to become more the norm than unusual. Uh, the flood project was established in 2005 uh, with a, through a flood project coordinating committee and it set out these goals, flood damage reduction being a big one, but also restoring the ecosystem of the Truckee River, bringing back fish, and providing recreational opportunities. What we're going to talk about today, I've, I've given so many talks about flooding, today I really wanted to talk about the watershed as a whole and our efforts to restore it. These are the many partners, and they go from sort of the community coalition is a group of people, 600 strong, that have nothing, nothing more to identify them than a name. They're not a nonprofit. They just came together because they wanted to help fix our river. Uh, the Nature Conservancy is uh, one of the major partners on this project. And then you have the cities of Reno, Sparks, Washoe County, and the county. And then you head to a regional agency, the Truckee River Flood Management Project, which I was the executive director of, their first. Uh, then you go into the state agencies that worked with us, the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe, a sovereign nation, and then these four uh, federal agencies. So the community coalition came together over a three to four year period, and it really lasted until I left the, the group. And they said, what do we want to achieve, and how are we going to get there? And they put together through a series of charrettes, uh, a series of projects that they thought would both manage flooding without getting into a lot of concrete, manage it more naturally, using uh, the river and uh, the banks in a more natural way. Um, they wanted to have setback levees rather than flood walls right on the river. They wanted to do this river terracing. I have a picture later, replace the bridges, and we just replaced the Truckee River Bridge as part of this project. Uh, buy a lot of land. I bought $50 million of land while I was there so that we could buy the land, tear down the buildings, and let the flood flood naturally. Um, and then do the riparian restoration and build within their urban watershed parkways. So a lot of people don't know that much about our geography, but the reason it floods is this. You're looking at an aerial view of the um, wastewater treatment plant right here. This right here on the corner is where Steamboat Creek comes into the Truckee River. Here is the Sparks Industrial Area, and this is an area known as the Vista Narrows, which is very narrow. And what happens is that water is coming down the river, and it just uh, jams up right here like a bathtub with a very narrow uh, drain. So the Corps of Engineers back in the 1960s came, we invited them in, and we said, we need your help, we need to fix this problem. And they said, we've got just the answer. What we can do is blast out this narrows, make, you know, make the drain wider, so the water will rush out faster. And then they said, what we can also do is in, we can take all the curves out of the Truckee River for the next 25 miles and just make it a straight shot. And if you think about it, if you're on a um, 
You can always go a lot faster on a straight road or a freeway than you can, let's say, going up to Lake Tahoe on um, the Mount Rose Highway, which has a lot of curves in it. You've got to slow down. It's the same thing with rivers. They go slower when the stream bed is curvy, and it's a natural geographic condition uh, uh, from eroding rocks. But what they did was they blasted through all the old oxbows and curves, and they made a straight river. And what that did was it, it increased uh, the velocity, and so it started cutting down the river bank. So the river used to be up here, but it's now down here. And often I explain if the river was right here on the ground, uh, the bank is about 12 feet high from where I am. So that's where it used to be, and that's where the plants grow, and that's when the river was up there, that's where the fish would spawn, and well, breed and spawn, lay their eggs. But now the problem is, is that the fish are down here, and their food source in the areas that they would lay eggs are up here. Um, it created very unstable riverbanks, uh, lower, uh, lowered the groundwater table. We, obvi we obviously lost a lot of riparian habitat, and they say about 70% of our uh, species. So the diversity of the species really reduced to what could live in this environment. And then, of course, the water quality got worse because as the water rushed through, it got very turbid. You had to pick up a lot of sediment. There wasn't an opportunity to settle. There was no treatment by the riparian areas. Not good situation. So as part of the flood project, um, and of course, noxious weeds invaded, of course. So as part of the flood project, we said, um, maybe we should restore the Truckee River. And uh, what we determined is that only 1% or so of the Great Basin is a water, a river, a floodplain, a wetland. And yet 75% of the species that are in Nevada depend on this 1% of the water. So it's a very special place. Here's an example of what I just showed you a picture of, and here's a diagram, and you can see that what happens is that incised channels cause the riverbed water table to drop, scours out the channel, leads to incision, native plants can't reach the water, right? Now they have to go really deep, and invasive weeds take over. After restoration, what we find is that we've brought back the water much closer to the banks. We have... Uh, created much better habitat. The plants can root naturally right down into the wet bank. Um, and it brings in, all the natives come back. And we have the river connected to the floodplain groundwater rises. And so you have a much more sustainable system. Now, you may not realize this, but we've begun to do this actually in the downtown Reno, uh, Truckee Meadows area. And so this area, just to get a marker for you, um, let me see here. This is McCarran. This is the Sparks Industrial Area. Mill is right here. Here's the Sparks Whitewater Park. What we did was we bought all this land in purple. And what we did was we tore down the buildings. Okay, right in here especially. And right in here, these buildings that you see are no longer there. And the idea was that we would build a levee all the way along in here and we would let the river flood naturally in its old floodplain or portion of. You know, this is called the Truckee Meadows. It was a wet meadow, most of this area. And you and our farm, some of you may be familiar, this is actually looking east. So here's Vista Narrows, here's Sparks Industrial, and here's you and our farm. And we were planning to terrace back the bank right there. I'm going to focus, though, most of the rest of the talk on downstream of this area. And right here is a map of um, the area. We got Reno down here, and then each of these represent a restoration area that was planned as part of this project. And then the Pyramid Lake Paiute Reservation is right in here. The, the goals, of course, were to attenuate flooding, to develop the wildlife habitat back again, improve water quality, and deal with the weeds. So here's a picture of the river. And what you may not see very easily on this picture, but you will once I bring in the next part, is that we have the old oxbows right here. Here's an example, and yet this was channelized straight through here. So I put this so that you can see it easier. This is how the river used to go, and this is how the river does go. And here's an example that the Nature Conservancy put together for their first project. They started a project around 2005, right when the flood project was starting at McCarran Ranch. They bought the ranch, about 400 acres, and this was its condition, a fairly straight river. And here's what they hoped to recreate was a very curvy river. This is a computer simulation. 
And this is what exists now with farmland in that general area. The idea was to get out the bulldozers, to get out the scrapers, to get the dump trucks, and start, you know, just like when you were a kid digging in the sand, only in real life scale. So here's a picture of uh, one of the wetland areas before restoration. And I want you to keep your eye on this tree here and this tree here, and then you'll be able to find them in the next picture, I think. That's after three years. Here is that tree, and here is that tree. I'm going to go back one more time. There it was. There it is today. This stuff really works. <laughs> so I'm going to walk you through just a couple of these projects, um, starting here with uh, Lockwood. It's just a few miles outside. Is this? That's not me. So. Oh. oh, it is somebody. Here, give me that. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's OK. It was like a, a scavenger hunt here. Um, anyway, we have Lockwood, and then we have um, Mustang Ranch, McCarran Ranch, and 102 Ranch. And I'm quickly going to show you some before and afters on those. So here's at Lockwood. We planted trees, and then look what happened in just a couple years. I mean, that's where we started in this very barren area that was all scraped down. And here's another picture, and you can actually, I spent some time finding myself here. So I think, right, there is a pole right here, and that pole's right around in here, and there's a tree here, and that tree is this right here. So you can see that what happened here is that the river um, used to come in through this area, and uh, they moved it. <laughs> let, me, let me come over here a little closer. Another picture of Mustang Ranch. Here was the river on the left, and they completely moved it. Here's where it used to be, and they moved it over here to create these big oxbows. This is actually the 102 Ranch, and we worked, of course, with the Corps of Engineers. This was at the groundbreaking. Uh, I know I'm in here, this picture probably. Here I am. And some of our board members, and this is just shortly after they had um, scraped out some wetland areas, and this is actually a, a sign that we erected to memorialize the project. And then here's some before and afters. Here's where we started. Here, and we're going to go clockwise on these. This is a few years later, and then this is today. So you can really see this stuff is working right here at home. It's happening. <laughs> Another example, this one is at uh, McCarran Ranch, which is actually the Nature Conservancy's kind of showpiece. Uh, this is right when they created the wetland system, uh, you know, created it, scraped it down. This is about two years later. And then a few more pictures. This was their, that was their east pasture. This is their west pasture. And you can identify, I think, some of these trees as well. In fact, uh, this mountain right here, Top of this mountain is top of that mountain. Okay. And then McCarran Ranch today. So pretty amazing stuff happening right here at home. And then in addition to the restoration, um, we also incorporated fish passage. These projects have been defunded at this time, but they're still in the books. The plans are still there to uh, bring back the endangered kiwi sucker fish, in case you haven't seen one. And they can get much, much bigger. Uh, although we'll hear about big fish later from Zeb, but, um, and then the threatened Lahontan cutthroat trout, which in its native environment looks pretty, pretty darn cool. Um, one of the things people don't know is that these are uh, the fish, there's a dam that separates Pyramid Lake from the Truckee River. The water dropped 100 feet over 100 years through diversions, and there is now a uh, dam, and these fish are not like salmon. They can't jump like tall buildings, you know, to go spawning. Um, so what they've done is they've put in a fish elevator, and they actually have the fish swim into the elevator, close the door, then elevate the fish up 100 feet to the river, and then let them out, and they continue their journey to do spawning. They also have um, a bypass channel and fish ladder, and we were going to build a much more elaborate. This was actually probably designed still too steeply, these, again, these fish don't have the strong muscles that salmon do, and they can't make it up the stairs. 
And then um, finally, we also wanted to add some recreation throughout this project and example trail, kayaking, rafting opportunities. There was plans to build a big um, amphitheater as well. And so finally, what kind of success? Well, obviously, a great deal. I went in uh, before this talk, talked to a few of the people that have been still working on this project. I left about six years ago. But what has happened is that, especially in the area of birds, they've had an increase, a very significant increase in bird diversity numbers, of course. Uh, increased size in fish, and what they're, happening, what they're finding is that the fish uh, are actually concentrating in the restored areas, I think, for better breeding. And then um, some of you may have heard of the Tahoe to Pyramid Lake Bike Trail, which is well on its way to completion. Uh, we, every part of this, we built bike trail segments through it. Um, and then finally, of course, with all the replanting, the vegetation, the shading, and the spawning, you get um, this kind of uh, recovery of birds and uh, fish. So that wraps it up for me. I just wanted to give you a very brief insight into what's happening right outside your door, only, only you know, a few steps away. And you can go see some of these projects. Um, Lockwood is a park today. Um, McCarran is open periodically. All you have to do is go on the Nature Conservancy's website and they have events there. I went to some really neat, um, you know, really neat events there. So look for those. I don't know if you're doing questions or later. We're going to do that. Okay. Later. All right. Well, thank you so much. Our next speaker is Chairwoman Jennifer Eisel. Okay, so my name is Jennifer Isla. I'm a um, Shoshone Paiute tribe from Duck Valley Indian Reservation, and I am currently the chairperson of the Western Shoshone Committee of Duck Valley, which is a non-political position, but it, it was a congressionally recognized um, group for the for the Western Shoshone members of our tribe because it came as part of our land claim settlement under public law 108-270. So we are stakeholders in um, you know the 25 million acres in Nevada that that is our federal trust lands. So we get we do a lot of consultation on um, extraction in Nevada and um, how does this work? What did I do? Okay, so okay, so so one thing that we've been looking at is is this um, the lithium brine extraction in Nevada, what what it's been doing historically, and and what will probably happen in the future based on, you know, the history of Clayton Valley, Clayton Valley, um, Silver Peak, Nevada. Um, we, we like to look at new extraction techniques from a cradle to the grave process. Um, our, tribe, our tribe has been impacted by a historic copper mine, which is now, it's been closed since the 80s, but it took us a good 20 years to negotiate with the mining companies and get the surface, the surface part remediated, but our water, um, you know, it's about 10 miles away from us, but our water table, the mine pool is leaking, and so we have orange water coming out of our faucets now, which has been progressively worse for probably the last 25 years. So there, there really is no remedy for that except to build a municipal water system and pipeline water from, hopefully we could locate a cleaner source, but that's probably a decade in the planning and implementation. So, um, would would we hear something like like lithium is going to get expanded, and and how what kind of a large scale, you know, we're looking at. You know, we kind of like to do our own due diligence and see exactly what the long term impacts are going to be. So, you know, we acknowledge that we're all consumers. We all play a role. Um, yeah, but but what are the consequences for that? So, um, you know, I, I don't know how much you guys have heard about lithium ion batteries, but I was, I was really surprised that Nevada doesn't have the capacity of lithium to supply the gigafactory. So they're, they're looking all over, you know, how to develop new extraction. Well, they're not new extraction techniques. They're going on in other countries, but they're, they're not 
currently legal in the United States to get a permit, you know, to get new permits on that scale, partially because of infrastructure, water rights, um, just the, the length of time that it, it takes to get a permit passed or multiple permits passed for one operation. So um, this, this is what it looks like. This one is in Chile, but they have all the um, brine evaporation ponds, so they're boring into deep geological aquifers and drying out um, salty brine from below the water table and evaporating it. They separate it out into evaporation ponds. Um, at the lower part of the screen there, those two little black dots are, are like large scale mining equipment, you know, that are just like pushing around the salt brine, you know, and then they process it and it, it goes either into powder or pellets and they ship it ship it out of country. So this is going on in Bolivia, Argentina, um, Chile are, are the main, there's, there's some in, um, I wanna say Australia that they're working on developing right now and they're wanting to expand this into Nevada. So it's, it's pretty concerning. Um, so, there has been an investigation going on by Amnesty International for, uh, for I want to say, probably about 10 years where they've been trying to expose, you know, it was just a small thing where, where it was just like laptops and cell phones, you know, smaller technologies, and now all of a sudden the, the demand for it has just exponentially exploded. So, um, so, the, so the, there's, there's like a three-part series in the Washington Post about the, the three main components that would be um, the lithium, the cobalt, and the graphite. So that would be a really good, um, a good reference series to look at, but everybody kind of raised their eyebrows when Elon Musk was, you know, signed up to be Trump's advisor, and then all of a sudden Dodd-Frank gets repealed because that's the law that, that makes corporations disclose conflict minerals because these um, extraction techniques, what am I doing? Sorry. Um, you know, it, in South America, it's really having a bad impact on the indigenous tribes. They're a lot like us as Western Shoshones where they're, they're hunters and gatherers. They um, herd, you know, they herd their animals around a lot. They're having to travel further and further from their villages because there, there is no water because they've drawn down the aquifers so far. You know, that there, there's nowhere for their animals to drink that's not contaminated or, or them. You know, it's, it's pretty big impacts on migratory societies and, and they also have issues with sacred site destruction. Um, the hot springs are, are a traditional resource for them, but they're, you know, they can't bathe in them anymore. So it, the air quality, um, health impacts, I mean, it just, it's cumulative impacts. The graphite, the same thing in um, Eastern Asia, you know, it's causing the health impacts, you know, any kind of rare earth mineral. I think there's only one rare earth mineral mine that's permitted in California, but, um, it's, it's pretty common in China, and I think the, expect, the life expectancy is like 50 years old because people just get sick and die. You know, it's their, everything is contaminated. It's their food source. It's their water. You know, that's developing nations, you know, always get impacted the hardest, and that's what, you know, we've lived that already. We're out there, you know, in these rural areas. That's where our communities are. That's where we gather our food, so... You know, it's it's going to be the same thing transfers back to Nevada when these when these extraction um, places expand. Um, cobalt is is from the the Congo, and that's you know conflict minerals because there's human trafficking, um, you know, child labor. Um, not a pretty picture over there. So they're, so they're importing all of that to put into you know, the, any kind of lithium ion battery. I, kn I know that some companies have done disclosures on it, but Tesla never would. They refused to um, say where they sourced their materials for several years, and, and now they've found a way around that. So it's just, I guess my point is, you know, we should do our due diligence before we embrace some kind of new, you know, rapidly expanding, 
you know, new, new, um, it's a battery. It's not even generating. <laughs> it's not even generating energy. So I, I don't know what you want to call it. You know, it it stores energy. Um, this this is um, Silver Peak, Nevada, Clayton Valley Minerals. It's it's down by Goldfield, kind of in the Tonopah area. Um, it was historically it was a mining town, but then the whole the whole town burnt to the ground, and it's kind of been rebuilt since there. Um, the main mining claim is Foot Mineral, and they've got, it's owned by Chem Metal Foot, Chem Metal Foot Lithium, which was also Western Lithium for a while. Silver Peak Lithium is there. Um, there's, there's a whole bunch of overlapping mining claims and companies, but it's, it's generally just considered one production. It's been there since, let's see, it was funded in, as a lithium mine, it's existed since the early 80s. Um, they have been extracting brine for, you know, that long, but there was a, I want to say there was a hydrological survey where the water engineer determined that it was kind of a closed eco basin, and if anything went wrong, it wasn't going to, um, you know, go very far or damage anything. Um, so they've been extracting lithium for an area of about three square miles, you know, for, for a long time, but it's, not, it's nowhere near the volume that they need for Tesla. Um, so there, there's all these new claims out, you know, in Nevada. What happened to those Washington Post articles? Did I, were they there? Okay. So, so that's how it looked. I want to say that photo is about five years old. They just got a new permit to expand it where it's, it's like trickling into adjacent valleys where, where they're extracting from. Um, now they're looking at extracting salt brine and kind of processing it and re-injecting the water so it will, it will um, you know, kind of refill the, the aquifer that they're drawing from but you know there's always a danger you know I know because I live by a historic injection well that that the casing has you know that it, it doesn't have the the structural integrity that it had when it was built back in the 1930s so it's it's breaching and it's leaking and it's coming up in our groundwater you know 10 miles away so it's like these things are only going to last for so long um, so, okay, so those are all the companies that are down in Clayton Valley. Um, lithium has always been kind of a fuel for um, Department of Defense, you know, space exploration, Department of Energy. Um, it's never been really a consumer product until recently. Um, I lost some of my notes on this, but, but I was looking at... Um, Clayton Valley, there's the town down there, there's only about 40 people who live there, but they applied for a new um, stormwater release permit with Nevada Department of Environmental Protection. In 2012, um, the appeals went on, I think, until 2014. But I was looking at some of the um, evidence that the complainants were filing, and it included like uranium in the groundwater, documented cases of skin lesions on the children. You know, they acknowledge that it's migrating through the aquifer because they've just been spilling this out onto the flats for like the last 35 years and just letting it evaporate. You know, there's, there's no containment basin. There's no, there's not really anything that's gonna prevent it from like leaching back into the groundwater because you know, the aquifers have to replenish from somewhere. So it's, it's just, it doesn't look very good for the future from, from our point of view. And um, I guess it's always, in, you know, questionable what the long-term consequences are gonna be. And that's just, you know, at that volume in Clayton Valley. So um, let's see, they've got, Where's my notes? I don't want to get into too much. They're, oh, they're also extracting magnesium. They're, they're separating 
the lithium from the magnesium, so they are in compliance with the Multiple Mineral Development Act, which was, you know, it, lithium carbonate used to be extracted by hard rock mining laws. It came from a hectorite clay. It was processed down to its final material, but this, this whole thing with the water processing is, is relatively new. It's, it's not brand new. You know, they do it in other countries, but there's, this is Nevada. We don't have a lot of water rights. All the surface water is spoken for, so it's really hard to develop a new water right in Nevada now. It's, it's, it's all claimed. Um, so when they pump up the brine and it goes, it goes through a rec to a recovery plant through a pipeline, and then it goes through their processing facility, then it gets packaged and um, it goes to mine by rail car, and then it goes on to its, its final destination. So there's like a lot of transportation infrastructure that needs to be, you know, factored into producing these materials as well. You know, they're not, they're probably not going to be battery powered either. So um, I think Clayton Valley has about 30,000 acre feet annually that they can pump from the underground aquifer, but uh, they just have their, I want to say a few hundred mining claims there, but since um, Tesla opened in 2014, we're up over 13,000 new placer claims that have been filed in Nevada, um, kind of just focusing on Clayton Valley, but the other areas include the Black Rock Desert, um, up by Sheldon Wildlife Refuge, up by Honey Lake, um, northern Washoe County. Uh, there's a Fish Lake Valley, and uh, there's several areas in California, but all of those companies are the same company. You know that they're they're all. Um, I believe they're all Newmont subsidiaries. You know, and they are um, connected to Abermarley, which is the big mining operation down in South America. So there's. That's their layout. Their layout. The the Rockwood is is the base of it, but that's how they're expanding out in Clayton Valley. And you can see there where the original, the original evaporation pond, but, but now they're pumping out more volume, so it's shedding over into the next hydrographic eco-basins. So that's, those are kind of <coughs> new, but it's going to be a mess. Um, that's one of their newer explorations where they have a permit to, um, pump out the geothermal brine, they actually got their permitting under a geothermal exploration permit. They're looking um, around the hottest hot springs. I, um, being out there in the rural areas, we're getting a lot of um, remote sensing done by aircraft, you know, where the, where the planes are just like flying really low, you know, just going back and forth over, you know, over the mountains like all day long. And you can kind of see when they're when they're getting towards a hot spot, because they'll spend a lot of time there, you know, just mapping, mapping at different at different depths. So, um, huh? Okay. <laughs> so there was just some. Um, so this was mostly funded. The expansion was mostly funded in 2009 under the Workforce Reinvestment and Recovery Act amendments to the Energy Policy Act of 2005. They got a 30, $30 million grant from the taxpayers to do that, to develop those claims. And right now, um, I think the water issues, the water drought issues from Nevada water engineers are pending with Nevada Division of Minerals and um, Nevada Division of Water Resources. So they're looking at amending the laws so different companies can um, access some of those that underground water. But there's also federal legislation that needs to be amended as well. Right now, we're kind of watching um, the critical mineral an infrastructure development act that was just introduced in January and that includes transmission lines, pipelines, um, Pershing County Land Transfer Act. I don't know if you guys have heard anything about a five county pipeline that ends at the Gigafactory. That's, you know, connecting, you know, some of the claims at the Black Rock Desert and it would come across the Pyramid Lake Reservation and it ends right there at um, 
whatever their address is on USA Parkway. It, it, it connects, there's a whole gathering line system that connects it to a whole bunch of um, claimed areas, you know, even, even down on the other side of Fernley. So it'll be a pretty complex system. So I just don't think, you know, everybody's aware of, of what we're looking at here as far as infrastructure and expansion. So just, um, you know, trying to make people more aware of, of the potential impacts from just embracing, you know, divest from fossil fuels and where is everybody putting their, their financing into, you know, something like this. But it's, it's kind of an eye opener to see what the long term results will be. So thank you. I bet you guys are dying to ask questions, right? <laughs> okay, our next speaker is Doc, Dr. Kathy Fitzgerald. Okay. Hey, I just wanted to thank Julia and TMCC for the opportunity to come here and speak. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how to do a sustainable water project in a third world country. Um, so I was a volunteer in the Peace Corps in Bolivia for um, two years from 1992 nine to 2001 um, doing gravity flow water systems and sanitation projects and for all you students out there if you ever have the opportunity to join the Peace Corps I highly recommend it. But my very first project overseas was over 20 years ago with Lifewater International in um, South Sudan in the middle of a famine and um, a, a civil war and it was my job was um, as a water person on a medical team to find ways to get clean water for their emergency uh, feeding center. And the feeding center was uh, mixing um, Unimix, which is a high protein oatmeal uh, with water. And then they were doing medical um, clinic and diagnoses as well. And the problem is that the month before we got there, um, the government of Sudan, had, the army had come through and they had killed a bunch of men in the villages and, and raped some of the women and took the children as slaves. But they dumped the, the bodies of the men down the wells and so they contaminated the water supply. So it was my job to try and find a clean water source and what we ended up doing was um, pumping water from a river um, through camp filters for 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the three weeks that we were there. And that was, um, pretty hard circumstances, but it got me into this passion to do third world water projects around the world ever since then. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, another NGO, Water for All International, and then um, I've been taking students from UNR um, with an organization called Say We Students Associated with International Water Issues um, overseas to do um, clean water projects, and they're mainly um, graduate hydrology students, but there's other um, students as well. Art majors comes in handy on these projects as well. Um, so we've done projects Sudan, Haiti, lots of places in Africa, um, Peace, Corps, Peace Corps in Bolivia, Guatemala, um, Sri Lanka, Cameroon, and Rwanda. And about half of those places were um, projects with the UNR students. So now I want to talk kind of what, about, what works with the sustainable water projects and what doesn't work. Um, so if you want a project that's going to fail, um, use an unproven technology or something that's very high tech um, that has a fast scale up period. Um, where you don't part have any community participation. Um, the NGO or the non-government organization or charitable organization is the one that decides what project they're going to do and then they do all the work while the villagers are left on the sidelines. Uh, there's no training of local people. There's no involvement of women, which is really important because in water projects, it's the women that are always hauling the water. Um, no maintenance of the system, no replacement parts, and no local ownership. So now we'll see a project that has all of these components in it. Um, it's a project called uh, Play Pumps International that started back in, in 2006. And they have this system where there's a drilled uh, borehole or well and they put a little uh, merry-go-round on top of it. And then with the movement of the merry-go-round, it pumps water to the top of this elevated tank. 
and then gravity flows to the point where you can extract the water. And they have, they were going to sell um, advertisements on the water tank to the people. And here's kind of the kids playing on the, on the system. So the first pump was installed in 2006. Um, they had tons of sponsors, um, Save the Children, UNICEF, USAID, Laura Bush, the Clinton Foundation got involved, Jay-Z, a bunch of movie stars, and their goal was to do 100 pumps in 100 days. So they raised enough money, $60 million, and they were gonna serve 10 million people with this system. Um, what went wrong? Um, they installed these on existing boreholes, so they replaced a hand pump with this merry-go-round. So a hand pump cost $1,500, and they replaced it with a merry-go-round and the, the tank system for 14000 What happened was the children had to play 24 hours a day in order to <laughs> pump the water up to the tank and serve the community. And the problem is the kids get bored playing after a while, so then the women have to go out there and they're moving the merry-go-around around and uh, or sitting on it and, and playing um, in order to pump the water. Um, out of the 80 original systems that they installed, only 13 were operational. They didn't have any replacement parts. They didn't have any um, maintenance. So in 2010, four years later, um, Play Pump International went out of business, um, cost $60 million, and that would have, if you had just done boreholes with hand pumps, that would have done 40,000 boreholes and served probably a million people. So that's one example of what can go wrong. Here's another one with a pipe water system for a system that we saw in Rwanda. What they were doing is they were taking water from this river uh, pumping it to this pump house and then pumping it to these elevated tanks on top of a, a concrete platform. Um, and so they had a whole system. It was serving a school and a refugee camp. They had a whole system where you had um, pipe water and they had, you know, poor flush toilets. Uh, very nice, you know, all this plumbing involved. Well, what happened is that after less than three years, um, they pump broke, and before that, they didn't even have the money for the diesel fuel, but the pump was from the, um, Italy, and they also needed a generator to run the pump, and the generator needed diesel fuel, and so after three years at a cost of $250,000, um, it, it broke. Uh, it was no longer functional. So now what they're doing for the refugee camp is they're hauling water in um, two times a week, um, to a 10,000 gallon tank at a cost of probably about um, 200 to $400 a week. So. so what's the solution for these large scale projects? It's the latest kind of buzzword in the industry is self-supply. And what that really means is just doing incremental improvements that you can do on a household or a community level um, using money that the household or the community provides. And so it's training them to provide their own supply. Um, here, here's an, a couple examples from projects that we did in, um, in Kenya. Um, this is a borehole where they're getting water out of a, a girl in the Maasai Mara. And here's another guy kind of scraping away the scum to get the water off of a lake. Um, this is an incremental low-cost solution. So you put the boards up over the, the hole so that people aren't stepping in the water, the animals aren't getting in. You can put fencing around the borehole uh, or the spring as well um, to draw the water out. Um, another, so if you've got, you still have contaminated water, so how do you get clean water once you bring this water home? Well, there's a simple method called the SOTUS method. It stands for solar disinfection. And this is something you can do if you're on a camping trip and you forget your filter or whatever, uh, iodine tablets. Um, you just take a two liter plastic bottle, fill it with water, um, put it out in the sun for ten, six hours, um, and the combination of UV radiation and heat um, inactivates the pathogens and you have clean water. We actually did this in, in a, taking water from a river in Kenya. Um, it was really contaminated and dirty. After six hours, we tested the water before we treated it, and we tested it after, and it was clean to drink, no bacteria. 
so it does work. Um, here's a picture in Kenya of a woman doing the SOTUS system, and even if you have a thatch roof, you can get a little bit of corrugated iron sheet and, and use that. You can also um, paint the back of the bottle black, and it actually increases the heat and the effectiveness of it. Um, here's another system with a, a rack, and they're um, doing the SOTUS bottles. For that. Um, in Kenya and in lots of other third world countries, they, you are able to get chlorine at the regular little kiosk or, or neighborhood store. And this is in Kenya, it's called Water Guard. Uh, you put a couple drops into your bucket of water and it, it uh, decontaminates and deactivates the bacteria. Uh, cost is minimal, 56 cents per month for family four. So there are promotions all over Kenya and other you know, African countries for this simple technique. Um, another little kind of step up from that is a, a water filter. Um, this is one that they manufacture in Kenya. It probably costs about $5. Um, and in, when I was in Peace Corps in Paraguay, we saw this filter that a family had made out of uh, garbage cans. And then now there's an industry in Kenya that does biosand filters, and what it does is you pour the water into the top of this uh, filter. It filters through sand and gravel and then flows up and out, and um, you get clean water. Um, there's a whole industry where people are actually manufacturing the filters, so you're putting people to work, and people are buying them. I think it costs about $6 to make, and they sell them for about $15 or $20. So it's definitely affordable at a, a local level. Um, spring protection. This is a project that we did in Rwanda. It's an unprotected spring in an area called Ingarama. And here's uh, people getting water from the spring. What we did was um, it just a simple protection of the spring. So the water continues to flow out, but it's now there's filters and gravel behind it. And so you're getting clean water. And there's also if, um, a, a thorn fence. Uh, you can't really see it, but around the area to protect it to keep all the animals out. So cost of, of doing spring protection is maybe $2,500. But you know if you divide that into 250 families who use that source, it comes out to $10 a family. So it's definitely affordable. Um, here's a simple rainwater harvesting system. It's just part of a gutter in, in a 55-gallon drum. Um, a little more sophisticated system is one that we did in Lupina, Guatemala with the UNR students. And uh, Mark and Clemencia Klen are in the back there who are our sponsors for this project. Have, have been following me as I as I do these talks throughout <laughs> Reno. Um, so um, this is a sample of the village. Um, we're installing the um, a rainwater harvesting gutters on the houses. Um, had families and, and kids helping out with the whole system. Um, and here's the difference between an American, um, a UNR student, and a, and a Guatemalan. <laughs> Um, but we, we did these rainwater harvesting systems on uh, two schools, um, four churches, and um, 25 families. So the cost for the entire system of uh, 31 rainwater harvesting systems was about $5,000. So, um, water wells. In lots of third world countries and around the world, um, a lot of people pay to have a well that's hand dug. And, here are some guys in K Kenya working on a hand dug well. Um, lots of times the well is not protected at all at the surface. You know, you're just d uh, dipping a bucket into it. So here, self-supply incremental improvements. What you can do is you can um, put concrete around and protect the source and, and the cover and cover the, um, the well. Um, going a little step further, you can do a little uh, drainage system, what they call a concrete apron, so that the water um, runs off and actually into the field and it's, you can see how green the field is there from the water runoff and there's a woman um, pouring the clean water into the bucket but you still have this um, rope that gets on the ground and gets contaminated as it goes up and down the well so another incremental improvement is just a, a winch 
so that you're hauling the water up and down and then you take this bucket and you dump it into the bucket that you're, um, you're going to haul home again. And then an incremental step further, um, here's a project that we did with you and our students in Kenya where we did a hand dr um, drilling method and this is the small uh, pump in Kenya. Here's one that we did in Bolivia um, where the people make their own um, pumps and so different handles and different pumps. And here's a project that we did that was a very first project with the SEWI students in 2004. Uh, we actually drilled a well, and this is a, a Mark II pump. Um, it was installed. There's a, a water committee formed by the women. There's certain hours where they can access the well. Um, it's working there, um, how many, what, 13 years later with, with no breakdowns or problems. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about one of the NGOs that I've been working with and, and some of the projects we've done with you and our students where you actually, Water for All International, you actually teach the families how to drill their own well and put on their own pump so that in the future if something goes wrong, um, they know what needs to be done. So their philosophy is that you're going to go form a water club and each family raises $100 or if it's a really poor area. It, it started in Bolivia. It was $50. Um, uh, Water for All International will loan them the drill rig and provide them with drillers that show the families how to do the first two wells. And then the rest of the families will um, help each other do the following eight wells. And they've done over 4,000 wells in 24 countries. Um, this is all, that, uh, all the equipment that you need to do a hand-dug well. So you can pretty much put it on the back of a donkey or a bicycle or a taxi and, and haul it out. Um, they make a, a drill bit out of the leaf spring of a car um, just welded together in, into a point. Um, and then you use a rope and a pulley to pull the um, drill rig up and down and it, it pretty much pounds it into the hole. And, there's water that comes out of this um, one-way valve and into a pond and then recirculates back down the hole. Um, this is a project, that, a SEWI project with the UNR students that we did in 2006 in an area of western Kenya called Robondo. Um, you can see the drill rig set up and the people pulling on the rope. And it's manpower, not horsepower. Or actually, it should be woman power and manpower. Um, and um, we, at this location, we had trained um, four women how to drill, and these are two of our women drillers. So they're, they're pushing down on the, on the pipe, on the drill stem, and it goes all the way down to the bottom. Then you add a second, second layers of pipe until you get down to your final depth. And here's just a little video that should show, oops, should show um, what, maybe it's not working. It's embedded, but if it doesn't show up, don't worry. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Oh, it's not working. Um, but anyway, it's a, a video that shows the action of the drill rig going up and down and and drilling the well. No, I'm sorry. It, it, it worked on mine, but that's okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. oh, did you do it? That was my bad. I'm, I'm going to stop doing that. <laughs> sorry. Okay, no problem. Um, and then after you've drilled down to say 100 feet, um, you add um, a plastic pipe that you've cut with slots for your drill casing and your drill screen. And then put on a little handmade pump with parts that cost about $25 and you have your, um, your well. And this is a community um, in Kenya that we were serving. Um, I had a chance to go do this in Sri Lanka um, after the tsunami in 2005. Um, and this is, you know, the area where the tsunami came and it hit Sri Lanka. Um, this is what Sri Lanka, the area where we were up in northern Sri Lanka before the tsunami. And this is what it, oops, and this is what it looked like afterwards. Um, so the, it has, it's an island, so there's um, fresh water floating on top of the salt water, so you can't drill down too deep or you're going to hit the salt water. Um, we had one of the local welders in just this little kiosk in, in, down, in the little 
uh, town where we're working um, make our drill bits for us. Um, so we, we drilled these wells for um, a refugee camp in northern Sri Lanka because it was after um, another civil war. Um, and here's one of the local guys who was helping us drill who's his master um, plumber. And you can see how nice, beautifully he, he finished this well. Um, two of the girls that helped us out in the refugee camp. And this, this is, so the cost is $25 a well. Um, it was six meters deep, so about 20 feet. And when we did about 10 to 15 wells in the two, two to three weeks that I was there, and afterwards we thought, well, you know, this isn't going to be able to continue this on. And the people have done it on their own. They've done um, 100 additional wells the year after we left, I don't know how many they've got now. So this is, if you show them the technology, it's something that they can do. It's their own well, they're gonna maintain it, they're gonna take care of it. Um, so what to do for a sustainable water project? Um, you definitely need community involvement. Um, low tech so solutions and self-supply with incremental improvements are the way to go. Um, but you also need to uh, continually assess and follow up visits to make sure that, that things are working as they should. Um, here's some websites, just uh, waterforallinternational.org if you're interested in the manual well drilling. Um, Water for People is a great, you know, sustainable um, NGO that's been doing projects in, and I worked with Water for People in Bolivia when I was in the Peace Corps. And SEWI, Students Associated with International um, Water Issues is the UNR um, club that does these international trips and you can go on their website and see what they've got going. Um, but as Lao Tzu, I'm probably mispronouncing that, who's a Chinese philosopher and, and the founder of Taoism said, um, go to the people, live with them, learn from them, start with what they know, build with what they have, but with the best leaders, when the work is done, the task accomplished, the people will say we have done it ourselves. So that's it. Um, I know we're holding questions till the end, but thank you. Um, this, was, this was actually someone I know who was uh, with uh, Mission Air Force, um, and he, they had to wait till the um, sun went down before they could get back into their plane. <laughs> So our final speaker is Dr. Zeb Hogan. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Zeb Hogan. I'm a research biologist at UNR. I want to talk to tonight about <clears throat> water and biodiversity, uh, kind of sustainability issues from a fish's perspective, uh, and also how uh, large fish can be used as a tool, a storytelling tool, and also to provide insight <clears throat> about the challenges and some of the solutions dealing with uh, water and sustainability. Uh, to provide you a little bit of context, I'd like to take a step back. A lot of this work originated from the catch of a very large catfish in northern Thailand in 2005. Uh, this is the world's largest freshwater fish. And when this fish was caught, uh, sort of started a project that I've been working on since then uh, that asked two fundamental questions. Uh, one, are there, so this is a, a critically endangered fish, a fish that's on the edge of extinction. And so the questions I asked when this fish was caught uh, are, are there other fish like this in other parts of the world that are uh, facing equal threats? Uh, and also, um, <clears throat> what can these fish uh, teach us about sustainable development and sustainable use of freshwater systems where these fish live? Uh, so I spent the last 10 years traveling all over the world visiting a lot of the lar world's largest rivers where these fish occur. So the Mekong, the Yangtze, the Murray Darling in Australia, the Congo, the Amazon, and the big rivers, Columbia, Mississippi, and Colorado that we have here in the US. <clears throat> and uh, what I found is that these big fish often face the biggest threats. So they're the most vulnerable. If we can protect, find ways to protect these fish, we also protect the smaller fish, 
uh, and the ecosystem as a whole. Uh, so there are um, umbrella species uh, that we can use to not only protect these large fish, but also the entire watershed. And I need to, I don't know why I, put, I use this. They're also charismatic. So this is uh, the Chinese paddlefish, which has been called the, uh, uh, China's underwater panda. But uh, I'm not sure if it's inspiring you guys to conserve fresh water the same way uh, that the panda does. So maybe I need to flip that picture out. Uh, so this is a map. These uh, giant fish occur all over the world. Uh, these show some of the swimways of the world, so some of the rivers that are necessary, migration corridors for these fish to uh, survive and complete their life cycle. Uh, and so now I'd just like to briefly tell you a little bit about some of these fish uh, and their stories. This is the world's largest trout. Uh, it used to occur in Russia, China, and Mongolia. Populations in Russia and China have uh, really declined due to overfishing and uh, dam building, habitat degradation. Uh, populations are really only healthy in Mongolia, uh, where we've been working on a project for the last 10 years uh, to use income from fishing, recreational fishing for these fish, to help with uh, watershed and, and fisheries management. Uh, this is a trout that can get up to six feet long and weigh up to 200 pounds. It's a, for those of you who haven't been to Mongolia, it's a beautiful place. This is a beautiful fish. Uh, the Chinese paddlefish, so this is the underwater panda, uh, a freshwater fish that used to get uh, over 20 feet long, uh, weigh more than uh, five or 600 pounds. And this is a fish that has not been seen since 2005. So maybe the first one of these giant fish that has unfortunately actually gone extinct. Uh, started with overfishing, uh, Three Gorges Dam was built uh, recently and may have uh, led to the extinction of this very unique and one of the world's largest fish. Uh, giant Murray cod in Australia, populations uh, in the 1900s, and this is a pattern we see in the US as well. There was a lot of um, development uh, unsustainable development in Australia, in the Murray-Darling Dar region for the last hundred years. And populations of this freshwater cod uh, grows up to two meters, 200 pounds, uh, declined by about 95% until Australia started managing uh, their water better, managing uh, uh, diversions and dams and water use better. And now this is an iconic fish that people like to fish, that people know about in Australia. And so in an effort to protect this fish, uh, people are also taking better care of the watershed. Uh, sharks and rays and sawfish of northern Australia, um, many of you may not know, you have some very pristine uh, waters in northern Australia, very dry areas where water is a scarce commodity. But these rivers support uh, one, two, three species of freshwater shark, uh, a very unique giant species of freshwater stingray, and so the and, and two species of, of sawfish, which occur in freshwater. And so these very unique uh, freshwater species in northern Australia are being used as flagships to help preserve some of these uh, unique systems. Uh, giant catfish in the Amazon. This is a freshwater fish that makes one of the longest known migrations, migrating from the foothills of the Amazon all the way to the Amazon estuary, a journey of about 5,000 kilometers. And it's a very important, uh, important food fish as well. And so you think about a fish that has to migrate 5,000 kilometers to, to uh, complete its life cycle, you need to protect, somehow re remain, uh, protect that whole watershed. And, uh, maintain connectivity between that 5,000 kilometers of, of watershed to protect the species. Uh, the American paddlefish. This is a paddlefish, uh, a fish that occurs in the Mississippi and in the Missouri. Uh, we uh, went up and found this fish in Montana in the upper Missouri River. It uh, gets about two meters long, has this very unique snout that it uses to seek out prey, and it's a source of American caviar. So if you buy caviar in the US, it, chances are it either comes from American paddlefish or from white sturgeon, uh, which is a species that's in the Columbia River, uh, in the Fraser River in the Pacific Northwest. This is an anadromous fish that moves from the ocean to fresh water to complete its life cycle. So it, like a salmon, it needs to move uh, from the ocean to fresh water. 
Uh, that used to be no problem. Here's the Columbia River watershed, a huge watershed, uh, all the way out into Wyoming, all the way up into uh, central uh, <clears throat> western Canada. So this was uh, the habitat of the white sturgeon, and it migrated throughout most of this system uh, until this happened. So this is another way, and we heard a talk about the Truckee River earlier, the same thing happens uh, in many, many rivers uh, all over the world and all over the US. These are all dams. So you have a fish that migrates from the ocean all throughout the watershed to complete its life cycle, and you can imagine the difficulty white sturgeon now have moving through the system uh, with all those dams blocking their migration. And then uh, finally, the Colorado pike minnow. So this is uh, one of the world's largest minnow species. Uh, grew up to six feet long, 200 pounds, lived in the Colorado River. This is an interesting species uh, because, so I grew up in Tempe, Arizona, where Arizona State University is. And I, I didn't know when I was growing up that I was gonna end up studying the world's largest fish. People always ask me, was a guy who grew up in the desert doing studying the world's largest fish? This photo was taken in the late 1800s. This is uh, Lee's Ferry, or, well, it's Tempe. It's where I grew up. It's the Salt River. And these giant fish used to occur about a mile from where I grew up. I never, this river was dry. This is a dry riverbed uh, when I grew up. I always thought the Salt River was just the name of a dry riverbed. I didn't even realize there used to be a river there and six foot long fish. So it shows you the changes that we've wrought on some of these systems. And of course, the same things happen here with the Truckee. We used to have a river that used to flow red with Lahontan cutthroat trout. And now because of uh, some of the dams and other things that we heard about, those Lahontan cutthroat trout are facing some uh, real challenges. Although I think we're on the uptick, hopefully, uh, with bringing back the Lahontan cutthroat trout. Uh, so now to shift to the Mekong. For those of you who don't know about the Mekong, it's the most productive river on Earth. Over two million tons of fish come from the Mekong every year. Most of the fish are migratory, so they're moving up and down the Mekong. And there are plans for 11 dams, mainstream dams on the Mekong River that would block these migrations. Uh, fish are very important in the Mekong. You see 3,000-year-old cave paintings where people were painting pictures of giant catfish. So it's not just me that was interested in giant catfish. Uh, you have floating villages. So this is a floating village on the Tonle Sap Lake, which is in the Mekong Basin. People living their whole lives on floating houses in the Mekong. And then these uh, arrow traps, they're fish traps. Fish swim along, hit the fence, swim along, and get stuck in these arrow traps. So fish are very important. You have uh, huge migrations of fish up and down the Mekong. So five billion fish, we're actually doing a story about this in, on the National Geographic website tomorrow, if any of you guys wanna uh, learn more about this migration, billions of fish moving up and down the Mekong and a biomass equivalent to the biomass of animals, zebra and wildebeest that move across the Serengeti. So incredibly important migrations. Uh, most of them are made up of this fish which is called tray reel which means money fish in Cambodia. It shows you how important it is. And the people there are, uh, equate this fish with money and they'll barter the fish with salt and rice. So it's a very, very important staple food and migratory fish in the Mekong. And then of course, these giant fish. Mekong giant catfish, critically endangered. Giant freshwater stingray. Giant Siamese carp, gets up to 600 pounds. Giant goonch catfish that gets up to 600 pounds. These are all these giant fish in the Mekong, uh, critically endangered, critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, all uh, facing serious uh, population decline as a result of overharvest, of, of, as a result of unsustainable activities. Uh, so the Mekong giant catfish, critically endangered, giant Siamese carp, national fish of Cambodia, Giant freshwater stingray, so a stingray in fresh water that can get up to about 1,000 pounds, 15 feet long, and the giant goonch catfish. And then this is kind of the, the point I want to make, and all these other fish as well. So these are seven striped barb, wallago catfish, river catfish. Uh, that, <laughs> that fish, I don't even think has an English name. Uh, these are fish that are on the brink of extinction. None of these aptosiacs, uh, 
have been seen, I think, since about uh, the mid-2000s. So these are some of the largest fish in the world uh, that are all on the brink of extinction. And uh, in the Mekong Basin, at least, uh, not very many people know about the situation and the plight of these fish, which is one of the things that uh, I try to change with, with my work. And it's one of the, I, I guess I'll bring it up now, it's one of the important things about, for example, work here with Lahontan cutthroat trout. You have groups here that know about Lahontan cutthroat trout, that are invested, that are interested, and those kind of groups are necessary uh, to help protect these fish and protect their watersheds. So we've just started a new project in the Mekong. It's called Wonders of the Mekong. Uh, we have lots of partners, USAID, University of Nevada, Cambodia Department of Fisheries, focused on highlighting all of the values, different values of the Mekong River and the importance of sustainable development. So what are some of the solutions? Uh, finding balance between our needs for water and the needs of aquatic life. So using science, for example, to get the most benefit out of things like dams at the least environmental cost by where you put dams, how you operate dams, uh, whether or not you build a dam at all. Uh, education, we uh, work with Cam uh, Cambodian NGOs. These are children reading a book about uh, fish ecology and conservation in Cambodia. Uh, for, I don't know if you, anyone had a chance to, but we also do international projects. This was a big museum exhibit that was uh, just at the Discovery Museum in Reno. Uh, all about the ecology and conservation of these giant fish. Uh, outreach activities, we had some activities here in Reno uh, for World Fish Migration Day. So this is a global event to raise awareness about the importance of the connection between fish, people, and rivers. Uh, and then finally, uh, partnerships. So partnerships with organizations like the Cambodian Department of Fisheries. Uh, we've had a long-term partnership with the Department of Fisheries, fishermen, and scientists to uh, release these endangered giant catfish and giant, uh, giant carp when they're caught in, in the Mekong River. Uh, so hopefully that provides a few insights about uh, kind of the plight of these big fish, how they can help us uh, understand how to sustainably sustainable develop these watersheds. Uh, and so I thank you very much. So we're ready to start now, and uh, Dr. Whitinger has a microphone back there, so it, it'll be standard question and answers for a while. So anybody have a question, let her know, and she'll bring the mic to you. Anybody have a question? I have a question. Oh. Okay. I know, the <laughs> panelists can interview each other. I'm sure of that. for every one of these people. <laughs> okay. Hi. I'm Brooke here. TMCC in the Division of Business, and I just had kind of a funny question for Dr. Hogan. Do you fish? I just had to ask because... So I, I host a television show, a fishing show, and I, I don't really fish. <laughs> I fish. So I fish. In Mongolia, we fish a lot uh, because that's how we get our, collect our samples. Uh, I grew up enjoying fishing. I would go with my cousin, go with my uncle. I think because I uh, work with fish, I'm around fish all the time, and I, I, I think I end up feeling kind of sorry for them. Mm -hmm. uh, Do you eat them? I eat, I eat fish, uh, you know, sustain, sustainably raised fish. Uh, I enjoy fishing like in Mongolia. I love it because uh, it's driving our research, it's providing us with information. Um, you know, when we do the shows, I enjoy it. It's a way to learn about the fish. It's a way to see the fish, because otherwise you can't, you can't see, you know? They, that, that's one of the bad, they got a bad uh, draw because people can't see them, and so it's hard to appreciate them. So I enjoy fishing because it gives me a chance to see, see the fish, and a lot of times we're collecting data. I don't, I, I'm not a huge uh, go out on the weekends, go fishing kind of guy. I think I have that means like never. <laughs> <laughs> I have lots of friends who go out like to Pyramid and love it out there. Um, 
and I like seeing their pictures, but I, I don't really fish. I'm going to add one more thing about his fishing, which is that he said collecting data, which is a sanitized version, I think, of how they do it. And I don't know, I mean, here in the Truckee, I mean, they electroshock the fish to collect and count the fish. It's, I always, it's a, it's a, what is it, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which is that you can know how fast something's going but never know exactly where it is, or you can stop it and now you know nothing about how fast it's going. So in order to study the fish and other things too, a butterfly or whatever, you end up having to kill it, right? And there's very few, t I was shocked to learn that way back when, and I don't know if many people out here do know that. Do you want to speak more to it? I'll just say we don't kill uh, any of the fish we study, uh, the endangered ones at least. Uh, and we catch fish all different kinds of ways. So in Mongolia, what? Mongolia, we're fly fishing, we're fishing with rod and reel. Uh, in Cambodia, we're just working with fishermen who are out there fishing. We don't do any fishing ourselves. In uh, other areas, we electrofish, which is where you sh stun the fish with electri electricity and then sample them. But, but do, we, they, do they revive? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah the revive, ones yeah, that, yeah. okay. Yeah. And I guess one more quick story, and this will give you an example. So we did a sh uh, TV show on short-tailed river ray in Argentina last year. And it's South America's largest fish, gets up to about 600 pounds. No, people don't know anything about it. So we went down to Argentina, and we had to find the things. And the only way to find them was to fish for them. And so we spent two weeks, like 18-hour uh, days, stayed up all night. So two weeks fishing. And on the last day, we finally caught one of these things. It was, looking back on it, it was great. It was like seeing the fish, you know, being one of the few people to see one of these fish and to learn about it by fishing with it and talking to all the fishermen. It was all awesome. The two weeks actually trying to catch the things and sitting on the boat 18 hours a day, I could probably do without that. I, don't <laughs> I think what you do is amazing. <laughs> and I'm very glad to hear that they, don't, that they can recover from the electric Yeah, shock. yeah, yeah, that's, that's the idea. If, typically, if the fish aren't recovering, it's on purpose. So you might see people sampling uh, for like an invasive. So for example, there's a project that our lab was doing, it wasn't me directly, but in the Tahoe Keys, and there are all these invasive bass and bluegill and uh, goldfish and stuff up in the Tahoe Keys in Tahoe. And they were sampling with electrofishing, but that was to remove them. Oh, they, okay. So they were Got taking it. them out. Got it. Interesting. So, yeah. but Thank the, you. But you can do it, you can do it both, both ways. ways. And usually, if it's an endangered fish or some fish that you want to keep alive, you don't set Low the... Shock. Yeah, Low shock. Yeah. Don't Low crank balls. the dial so high. <laughs> That's fantastic. All right. My name is Tyson. Uh, to the Truckee River Project, I have two questions, actually. Uh, the first one is for Truckee River. What are some of the foreseeable consequences to Pyramid Lake in this project? Consequences? To Pyramid Lake, yes. Well, um, I think it will only be beneficial for Pyramid Lake. The Pyramid Lake Pio Tribe was very, very involved in the design. And um, I haven't been involved in the project for about six years. But um, they had a consultant, a uh, very famous guy. And so we would meet with them about every eight weeks or so to talk about you know, how can this all work? There was a lot of concern, um, that's why they're so involved, about how we were gonna manage flooding and how flows were gonna work and, you know, how it's gonna interact with diversions and so on and so forth. But I think, it, and then the fish passage is right down there at Pyramid Lake. So there was uh, questions about where it would be built and how it would work. And, you know, if you're gonna have a, you know, if you're gonna have a steep step, it takes less space. If you're gonna have shallow steps, it takes much longer space. And there were all those kind of questions. But, so, I don't know where it stands right in this moment, but up until when I left, the collaboration was really good. Do you know something I don't know? No, just curious. Oh, okay. Yeah. My second question, my second question is for the t uh, lithium extraction. In an ideal world, I think we'd all throw our batteries away. Uh, we would re recycle them. But I think ideally, we all just throw them away. So how do lithium batteries, what are the consequences of the environment when we just chuck them out the window? Um, I've, I've heard, you know, through the media that they do have some kind of um, recycling program. But I, I think just history has proven, you know, with, with all forms of you know, fuels extraction, that there really isn't a long-term 
a long-term plan or you know for disposal and and i'm sure we'll find out in about 50 years when all those power walls you know read out there's going to be a cost to dispose of them and that leads to <coughs> illegal, illegal dumping as with any product you know it's uh, if Thank I could just add one thing about the about Pyramid Lake is um, my experience traveling around is that very little gets done with a lot of these projects and a lot of this work unless there's a local group that champions the the work and I think the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe and same thing with the Summit Lake Paiute Tribe but these you know groups that are that are there who are can act as champions for a lot of this work watershed management and sustainability work are really critical because yeah. otherwise it's just very difficult. Um, I think that's what one of the things the Mekong is lacking, or at least the, from a fish perspective, is uh, champions. You know that are really uh, championing the, the, the cause. I, th I think Autumn would like to chime in there. She's a member of the tribe, so yes, she can ask a question first. You sure? Is that okay. <laughs> I just have a quick question for Dr. Fitzgerald. Um, so a lot of the projects that you've been involved in have been in sub-Saharan Africa, and they're enduring a very severe drought. So I'm wondering how sustainable a lot of the wells gone deep enough, or the the project still functional as the water table continues to drop. Yeah, um, most of the projects that we've done in South Sudan, um, there was we've drilled a couple wells, and they were about. Um, 100 feet deep, and they are still functioning today. And but that's right near the border of Uganda and South Sudan, um, in the area where they have the drought and the famine. Um, I'm not sure um, what's happening there right now. All I know is is the civil war is reoccurred. The yeah. famine has reoccurred, which makes any water projects and kind now of now some of the aid workers have been killed. So it's it's a mess and I'm not sure people are able to actually go in there and find out what's happening. Okay. While we're running the mic, I wanted to mention in response to your comment about needing a support team, um, the Truckee River, I mentioned the community coalition of the 600, they were really a driving force. There are other groups, fast forward to today, there's a group called the One Truckee River. And I just wanted to mention it because if anybody's interested, they have volunteer activities and they are championing uh, kind of a next phase. And they're, they're championing bringing in social issues, homeless issues, dealing with waste uh, along the river, uh, having different kind of parks, doing more educational stuff, and actually forming a linear park through this 10 miles that goes from Reno through Sparks. And there's a bill up right now at the legislature to see about setting up a special general improvement district for a park district, just like a linear park. So, so things are still happening, you know, and evolving. So would that be, sorry, one, one River Yep, that's it, OneTrekkyRiver.org with a, you know, O-N-E. And they've already been up here. They, were, they had representative talk in one of the photography classes. So they'll come and talk in your class. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Autumn. Um, so I am a member of the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe. And so as far as I know, um, we're, the collaboration is still very good between the tribe and the rest of the agencies. Um, and I think with the tribal members who are, are really knowledgeable about the Truckee River Operating Agreement, um, we see it as being beneficial for the tribe. So we're supportive of it. Um, I actually had a question for Dr. Hogan. Um, so I'm at UNR right now, and I'm going to be graduating um, in May. And so being from Pyramid Lake, the Lahatan cutthroat trout, and also the Kui, we have a lot of significance to me. And I've worked at the fisheries um, for the past probably three years now. And so I was just actually wondering what you studied for your master's and, and for your PhD. I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do after I graduate, but fisheries is um, kind of ranked up there and something that I want to study. Yeah. That's awesome. That's great to hear. Uh, so for my PhD, I didn't do a master's. For my PhD, I studied the ecology of migratory fish in the Mekong. So I've kind of continued that <clears throat> after I finished my PhD. Um, I mean, so we, I can't, I, I'm not that familiar with Pyramid Lake. I mean, I know the fishery, mm -hmm. but uh, we have a project, a long-term project up at Summit Lake with the Summit Lake Paiute tribe. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, 
drawing similarities between the situation there and Pyramid, which uh, may, not, may not be totally appropriate because Pyramid's such a larger system. There's so many more people involved. There's so many more agencies involved. Summit Lake's a, a small lake. Mm -hmm. But uh, Summit Lake, all the work being done up there, uh, most of the work being done up there, there's a ton of environmental work, a ton of work on Lahontan and Cutthroat Trout, uh, long-term monitoring, restoration activities to try to uh, make sure the population stays healthy. And all of that work is being driven by a few people uh, uh, staff of the Summit Lake Paiute Tribe. And they're absolutely critical to that work up there. And they're doing research. Um, we have two master's degree students at UNR who are working up there full time, who are, who are just finishing up their master's. And they're actually been master's and PhD students from UNR kind of working up there continuously for the last four or five years. And so to hear you say that you're interested in that kind of work, I would just encourage you um, <clears throat> we really need people like you that are interested in that yeah. and the lakes do and the fish do and I would think that if you're willing to pursue that there would be a lot of opportunities for you um, and I, that's mainly speaking from my experience at Summit because we're always looking for people like you mm -hmm. who who would like to work with the, with the cutthroat trout I assume that Pyramid Lake's the same and maybe even more so because it's a bigger system and yeah. the trout have so much more value but I would just say go for it. Um, I would think I would think you could find some great opportunities. Could you answer a question for me? It's really for these other gals. We're really interested in um, seeing the fish elevator, seeing mm -hmm. what you do with you know propagating the fish. Is it um, there's one tour that I told them about. The Nevada Water Resource Association has a tour, and it's May 4th and 5th, but it's sold out. But you can <coughs> apparently go online and get on the wait list. But if they can't do that, is there a way that they can come out? Do you guys ever do tours? Well, so actually what's happening right now is they're doing the spawning for the Lahan cutthroat trout. And they're actually spawning, um, it's the Summit Lake strain. So every Tuesday for like the next, probably the <coughs> next three or four weeks, I think they've already spawned three times. Um, every Tuesday from like eight to noon, you can actually go to Sutcliffe and you can go and actually see the spawning process. and. It's really cool to see because um, the day before, they'll open up the spawn channel and all of these cutthroat trout just come into the spawn channel. And so what they do is they actually separate um, the males and the females, and then they, they extract the eggs from the females and then the sperm from the males. And then you could see the, the process on how they actually, or what they do with the eggs. And so it's a really cool process to see if any of you um, are able to go out there. It's totally free and open to the public, and the tribe definitely encourages the public to come and view that. And also, um, so once they start incubating the eggs, um, like throughout the summer, if you're ever at Pyramid Lake and you, um, I don't know, maybe you have like 20 minutes to kill, you can always come up to our hatcheries too, and we'll give um, some tours of our hatchery facility, and you can see you know, the little fish when they're babies swimming around in the tanks. Um, so there's opportunities like that. So what um, days did you say it was? On Tuesdays. Tuesdays? Yes. Is, is an appointment necessary? Or? No, anyone could just come out Tuesdays, like maybe from 9 to noon. Wow. They'll be out there. And yeah, it's really cool. You should check it out. They get really big. Yeah. Uh, another <laughs> potential opportunity is UC Davis has that environmental research center at um, Lake Tahoe mm -hmm. and a lot of the UNR hydrology graduate students were either interns there or did their masters there and they do a lot of different research okay. projects so that's something that you might look at as well. So I have a question for Dr. Hogan. Um, in regards to your fight to preserve all the bigger fish species that are out there, uh, I guess my question is on a global scale. Do you feel that in certain global areas of, on the globe that your argument may fall on deaf ears when it comes to the industrial side of things, when it comes to the dams and rerouting um, the streams, just like they're doing with the Truckee River and everything? Um, or do you feel you have enough sponsors and people behind you that it actually is making a difference? Good question. I feel like a lot of times it does fall on deaf ears. Um, when, <clears throat> so there are certain cases, uh, 
for example, the Fraser River in Canada. Uh, there's a healthy sturgeon population there. Uh, Fraser River flows through Vancouver. Uh, the population there is kind of very uh, uh, pro sustainability, pro environment. So, for example, I think the salmon runs and the sturgeon runs and the Fra the Fraser and the value people attach to those have probably kept that river uh, free of free of dams. Um, there are other places, Lake Winnebago, it's, well, I mean, there could, Lake Winnebago is the healthiest population of lake sturgeon that's being sustainably managed for the last 40 or 50 years with really strong community support, especially from anglers. So there are cases where, uh, where there have been success. <clears throat> the, the question I get more often actually is, do, are the fishermen supportive? Because the fishermen need to catch these fish for their livelihoods. The fishermen are incredibly supportive individually because they rely on the fish and they have a lot of knowledge about the fish and they want to see, see the fish stay in the river. But collectively is where it falls apart because it's very hard, for example, in the Mekong to manage that fishery. You have these fish that are moving all over the place, it, 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 huge numbers of people fishing and that collective management is where it falls apart. It's very difficult. And you have different, you have different, Cambodia is just one example, but it's like this everywhere. You have different cultures. So you have um, Vietnamese in Cambodia that are fishing. You go out on the river and they're actually different, people speaking different languages, fishing in different ways, and it's incredibly difficult to manage. So that's difficult. In terms of the hydropower, the, in the Mekong, the momentum right now is to build dams. And the way I look at it, it's a little bit of a, of a pessimistic way to look at it, but you have kind of a, a trajectory that the fisheries and the environment are on that's kind of down as more and more dams get built. And my, the idea, or at least my kind of goal would be to, to make that dip be as, not as shallow as possible and recover as quickly as possible. And to me, that's kind of sustainability is, okay, how can we, how can the countries develop the basin so that they don't lose very much and so that it can recover quickly. Um, the only times when I've actually seen it be successful is when there's very strong grassroot community uh, action. Um, state where the community has very specific things that they want, where, whether that be no dam or a specific kind of development or a specific kind of hydropower. Um, you know, I think about like, for example, lithium mining <laughs> and then I get worried, you know, we're, we're trying to get Tesla to do a solar city in Cambodia to show people an alternative to hydropower <laughs> causing other problems. But I think if you have a community where, and, and maybe I'm being a little bit optimistic, but where you have community involvement, where those mines are getting developed, where you have communities very empowered and able to be part of that process. That's the only time I've seen good outcomes. Um, otherwise, it's really difficult. All right. Um, my question was for, account, uh, for Chairwoman Jennifer. I was wondering, I, a lot of the data that you had was a little overwhelming on the slides, but is there another area we can go to get more information on that? And is Tesla, um, are they looking to lithium mine, and I apologize for my ignorance, here in Washoe County in the northern Nevada area, or is it all southern Nevada? Um, you could look at, I think it's USGS, MRDS, and it just, when you do a search, like type in lithium, and then all the claims will pop up, and there's a mapping option of that data. But um, an, another good place to look would be Nevada Division of Minerals. They have some general area maps. Otherwise, it's like searching just like claim by claim by claim. But, you know, that like Fish Lake Valley is on target. Um, there's a place out so Stillwater they're looking, Salt Wells. Um, just a little bit south of Sheldon Wildlife Refuge, there's some no-name claims. Um, from like King's Mine or Highcraft down by Winnemucca, all the way up that, I think it's Highway 93, that goes all the way up into Southeast Oregon. You know, that that whole area is slated for development and then all the way through the Black Rock Desert. Um, I, I see a bunch over by Fly Geyser, at Fly Ranch, you know, this, 
And that's a nice it's, place it's too. It's pretty. It's pretty <coughs> expansive. You know, thirteen thousand claims. There hasn't been that many in this short amount of a time. I mean, it's total new, new boom. So I heard that almost like every dry lake bottom has been claimed. Well, the, the ones that I just mentioned, I mean, yeah. there, there's, there's quite a few. Right, the big ones. There's the geysers, there's wells, there's all of them. Well, that's what I heard. I mean, yeah. that I, there, I wouldn't say all of them. Well, not every I, single I mean, one, but your bigger playa, what you think of as dry playa lakes. And the big issue, right, is, is it's dissolved in water, and there's this competition between needing to get a water right and a surface mining claim, and there, this session in the legislature, they're supposed to be, what, trying to come up with a new system of staking lithium climbs, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, they, they, they want to they kind of like make it a leasable mineral. Right, like you know, geothermal. Yeah, so it would be more like oil and gas leases to acquire the claim and then you know, that's not really groundwater, but N Nevada's in charge of all the underground water rights, so it's it's still, you know, kind of up in the air with with how how the the deep geothermal aquifers will be appropriated. Diana Lucas, and I am a new resident of uh, Nevada from you know where. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I. When I first got here, I heard that most of the state is owned by the federal government or BLM. 87%. So now I'm hearing that every dry lake bed could be a lithium thing. I'm wondering, well, is there money being exchanged or things being bought or sold? So that's one thing. How are they getting the land if it's owned by the federal government? And then the second thing is I went to a Nevada land trust um, presentation and they talked about the mines and the fact that you needed to have lecking credits because when you go and mess up an area of the land, I think, in Nevada, and you disturb, like the sage grouse, you need to compensate for that. So I'm wondering how can lithium just run out and find whatever it wants and start doing what it does? There's a huge backlog on, on approving any permits for exploration. I mean, there's, there's exploration permits have been approved, but as far as developing those claims, you know, if and when the time comes, I mean, anybody can go stake a claim. I mean, you could if you wanted to go stake a claim on federal land, but whether you would be able to, you know, get into production and, and put up the bonds that need to be put up, um, one thing is clear that the bonding amount is not high, as high as it should be, you know, and that, that is, there has been a um, open review period for public input on, um, I think it's under CERCLA, you know, what, what the, um, you know, if they should raise the bonding amount, and um, as far as Tesla goes, they were given um, what 15 billion in tax breaks over 20 years to locate here so there's there's you know a lot of political collusion going on you know between the division of minerals Nevada Mining Association and you know it, it might not be all I mean that's with every every kind of metals extraction you know there's the lobbying going on you know somebody you know, Congress is involved and, you know, things get done. So I'm going to pipe up. So um, my day job, I guess, if you will, <laughs> is um, my husband and I are geologists and we do mineral exploration. So we don't look for lithium, but we do look for other minerals like gold and silver and copper. Um, we have hundreds of claims in Nevada. Um, like you said, anybody can stake a claim if you know what you're doing. Um, many people don't know how big a claim is. It's 20 acres. So... Um, and each one has to be uh, recorded in the county recorder's office and filed with the BLM, and you have to pay a fee to keep that claim. Um, we have to pay annually, just in Nevada, $450,000 uh, to the federal government, the state, and the county for keeping our claims. That's one year. Um, we're just a mom and pop, and all we do is look for stuff. We don't mine. 
uh, what we do is if we find something that's interesting, uh, a junior company, so not a barrack and a Newmont, not the big companies, but a middle-sized company will come and lease that property, and they will spend millions exploring the property, doing mapping, sampling, geochemistry, um, every kind of data analysis, um, until they figure out there's either a something here or there's not, we're moving on. And then they give us the data so we improve our knowledge about the property, um, or we decide to drop the claims. So like you said, uh, if it's public land, BLM or Forest Service, you can stake a claim through this very established process. Um, and uh, if you want to know more, we can talk about it later, but it's been going on here for you know over 150, headed to 180 years, this system. And uh, you know, it's what why Nevada's here is the silver that they supported the um, Civil War with. Um, apparently, you had to have a certain population to become a state. Um, they made an exception for Nevada. Uh, I think we only had 20,000 people when we became a state, and I think the number was had to be bigger, like 50,000. But all those people are pretty much centered in the mining areas, including especially Virginia City. So, you know, it's been going on for a long time. And are, it's going are on. the claims mineral specific? No. So there's different kind. There's uh, load claims. There's placer claims, which are claims where you would pan for gold, let's say, in the California foothills. Um, that's different than a load claim. And basically, you are claiming, instead of just a piece of land and the surface, you actually are claiming the length of the mineral. So if the mineral strikes down, it might go under somebody else's land, but you're actually allowed to mine down the strike. Uh, there's, like she mentioned, oil and gas leasing, which is handled differently. Um, I did my master's in geothermal, so that's handled differently as well. There's these things called known geothermal resource areas. So, you know, it is, thanks for asking the question, it's, uh, you know, it's different for each of the kind of minerals. But a lithium claim would be separate from a the gold. The problem gold. is, they're is, unpatented, but yeah. They're, yeah, they're just listed as unpatented if yeah. there hasn't been, you know, a find in those areas. Mm -hmm. yeah. So an unpatented claim is one that you've just gone out and staked, and you used to be able, if you owned it for 20 years and you kept paying the fee, after 20 years you could actually file to patent the claim, which means the land itself became privatized. So you would, it's, it's like the Homestead Act or something, you would actually own the land, and that's a patented claim. And so most of ours are unpatented, but we do have, some, we have bought patented claims as well. But the problem with lithium is that you go and stake this claim, it's a rectangle, and the problem is is that the minerals dissolved in water for the most part. And so really you need to be extracting water, not, not hard rock. And so this is why they're looking at changing the entire way that they do this lithium um, staking a claim. Right, and mm -hmm. that whole process right now because it's all locked up. So, anyway, a little off topic, but since you're <laughs> like kind of looking amazed, I thought I <laughs> I, I'm just going to add something too to what's been said a few minutes ago, and it's another partial answer to your question. It's my understanding that Congressman Amity has put through or is proposing some legislation that would put uh, lithium extraction in like fracking into the Halliburton loophole. And, and I don't know if you know what the Halliburton loophole is, uh, but it's something that uh, I guess it was then Vice President Dick, Dick Cheney rolled out uh, to allow, so, so that fracking, the reason fracking can happen and there's not a huge amount of uh, environmental impact assessment and saying, no, we can't do that, you're destroying this huge amount of acreage of water and whatever, is it's in this law that says those things are excluded from the Clean Air and the Clear, Clean Water Act. And so uh, my understanding is Congressman Amity has proposed that we put lithium extraction in there as well, which would, of course, make lithium a huge boom in Nevada more so than it is. Is that, are you, is that do you know about it, that, Autumn? Is that, did I get that fairly accurate? I don't know about the Amity thing. I just know about the closure. Okay. All right. I don't know, Jennifer, is that accurate? I think that, that's my understanding. I've, I've heard that was the reason they were going to make it leasable mineral, but I don't know yeah. if that would automatically exempt it or they would have to do separate language to exclude it. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. No? Well, thank you so much for coming. This was wonderful. Yeah. I really appreciate everyone staying so long. Thank you so much. And thank you to the panelists. Yeah.